Amen. Amen. So getting right into Deuteronomy chapter 2 there, if you recall, um, the first 12 chapters here, just get Moses rehearsing uh, in the ears of the children of Israel all that had taken place leading up to this point where they're about to pass into the promised land. And of course, he goes back and reminds them of, of the mistakes that their parents had made. The, and of course, a lot of the great victories that they had just, again, told, uh, reminding them again of, of everything that had taken place and trying to uh, remind them, of course, so that when they go into that land that they would be obedient. And when we get into the later chapters uh, here, that's where he actually starts to teach the statutes and the judgments. But here he's just kind of rehearsing some more of the events that had taken place. And he says there in verse 1, he says, uh, and of course, begin, this is being right after they'd gotten turned back from the promised land, they failed to enter it in. And it says in verse 1, Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed uh, Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, You have compassed this mountain long enough to turn you northward. And of course, when we go through these books, or this book of uh, Deuteronomy, these chapters, there's a lot of geography, there's a lot of names, there's a lot of uh, uh, peoples that are mentioned, and you know, there's probably a lot of significance and meaning that you know, if we really dive deep and get into it, we could probably find out some interesting things. But the point I kind of wanted, when I'm preaching through these chapters, is we always want to just kind of make application. We kind of look at this and see what kind of things we can learn um, from the examples that we, we have in the Old Testament. And one of the things we see here is that, you know, God has had a specific plan for the children of Israel. It was his desire that they were to enter into the promised land. And, of course, because of their lack of faith, they didn't do that. Right. And but that doesn't mean God just gives up on them. You know, God didn't just quit on them. God didn't just say, well, you know what? You guys are never going to uh, be any use to me whatsoever. But God had a second plan. And, you know, that just goes to show us that there's we're never finished with God. Even if we mess things up, even if we make a mess of things, you know, God can still use us. So we should never get to the point in our life and say, well, you know, God's just never going to use me. You know, if you're still here and, you know, you're still, you know, drawing breath, then God's got a plan for you. You know, otherwise, why are you here? You know, God still has a reason for you to, to, to uh, be here and to do his work. And, uh, <clears throat> but sometimes, you know, when, when, when people mess up, like these people did here, like when they, you know, fail to believe the promise of God, you know, God had to chasten them. And it's the same way in our own life. You know, if we, if we mess up, God is going to chasten us. But he doesn't give up on us. He doesn't quit on us or, or quit on us. But he will chasten us. And, of course, what we see here is they had to go compass Mount Seir many days. You know, and then, of course, you know, he says there in verse 3, he have compassed this mountain long enough to turn you northward. So when he says long enough, you know, it was God's purpose that they would go and compass that mount for a certain amount of time. He said, look, you're going to go there, and you're going to wander around the same mountain over and over again. You're just going to go around this mountain, kind of wander around. But there's going to be a time when it's long enough. And what that kind of shows us is that, you know, Sometimes God, I, you know, what was the purpose of that? Well, I think maybe perhaps that God was kind of letting things sink in. You know, it was probably a big shock to them when they were trying to go into the promised land, and then they get denied. Then they send guys up, if you recall, and he says, don't go, I'm not among you. And they come out and they chase him as bees do, as we, as we read in verse 1. And, you know, they were, they were spitting up their enemy, you know. And so now they're probably in a bit of shock. God has to have them retreat, takes them out to see her, and I think he has them just wandering around so that the reality can begin to set in of what's about to take place. So they can let those words that God spake in their ears begin to sink down in their hearts and they can understand, look, we're about to go into 40 years wandering. But he says, you know, long enough. You know, there's a time and a place in our life where it's long enough. We need to stop wandering about. You know, if, if we've messed things up and God's dealt with us, you know, we need to let that sink in. But, you know, don't let that define the rest of your life. You know, there's a long, there, there's a point where it says, okay, that's long enough. Now it's time to move forward. Turn you northward, as he says here. It's time to pick a direction and start to go and let God begin to use you again. So it says there in verse 4, And he commanded thou the people, saying, Here to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a footbreadth. Because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for possession, ye shall buy meat of them for money that ye may eat, and ye shall also buy water of them for money that ye may drink. Now keep your finger there and turn over to Joshua chapter 5. It's real interesting that God sends them there, and these people are afraid. The terror is already upon them. They are already beginning to develop a reputation of those that could you know, uh, uh, defeat other countries, defeat other peoples. 
And that's what it says of Esau and God saying, but you know what, don't meddle with them. And he says, take heed. And he wants them to uh, take heed, good heed therefore, unto yourselves, therefore. He's saying, look, you better behave yourself, you know, because of the fact that, you know, these are Esau, this is, uh, the ch these are children of Abraham. If you recall, you had, uh, you, had you know, Esau, Esau is a descendant of Abraham, and God blessed Esau uh, for Abraham's sake. So, but what's interesting is, is that he tells them in verse 6, you shall buy meat of them for money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water of them for money that you may drink. Now, if you recall, up until this point, God has been feeding them with manna from heaven. You know, we, we, we probably all are familiar with the story that when they were wandering around, they began to complain that they had no meat, and God would, every morning, there would be manna upon the ground. They'd go out, and they would gather as much as they had meat, and, 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 and that that's what they were eating up until this point. And this is not, this, that did not stop. If we recall there in Joshua chapter 5, this is when the manna stops. Look at verse 10. And the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, even in the plains of Jericho. This is right before they're about to pass it over. And he says, And they did eat of the old corn in the land of the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day. And the manna ceased on the morrow that they had eaten, uh, after they had eaten the corn of the old land. So that's when the manna ceased. And if, of course, if you were to continue reading in Joshua 5, you would see that's when Jesus shows up, the captain of the Lord's host. So they had been eating the manna up until this point. This hadn't stopped yet. You can go ahead and go back to Deuteronomy. So why is God telling them then to buy meat and to buy water mm -hmm. from the children of Esau if they have this manna? Well, I think probably a, a big part of that is the fact that uh, God wants to just use, wants to bless Esau. You know, he wants them to, to profit a little bit from, from their wealth. Look there at verse 7 in Deuteronomy. It says, For the Lord thy God, so he's giving the reason why, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. So they're blessed people. You remember when they left Egypt, they had all those jewels. They had all those treasures. He said, He hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. So he's saying, look, you're going to go in there and you're going to buy of these people. Your brethren, he calls them. And what I think it's showing us is that God blesses us sometimes so that we can be a blessing to others. And really, the takeaway from that is that we don't want to go through life just trying to be some kind of a cheapskate. Amen. You know, God's not going to bless the guy who's just going to be stingy with everything that God gives him. Right. You know, God gives unto those that are willing to give. You know, the more that we give into, into men's bosoms, it shall be given unto us again, pressed down, you know, and, and shaken together, blowing over, the Bible says. So I think this is a good example of that in the Old Testament. God's saying, look, you're going in among these people. I want you to buy meat of them. I want you to buy water of them so that you can bless them. They didn't need it. God was going to take care of them. He says, look, God's blessed thee. He knows you're wandering through the wilderness. Right. God has brought manna down from heaven for them to eat. It's not that they necessarily needed this. It's because God, I believe, wanted to bless these people because of the fact that they were descendants of Abraham. And as an example to us today, that if we want God to bless us, if we want more from God, then, you know, we have to be people that are generous. And uh, I think this ministry, Faithful Word Baptist Church, is a great example of that. I mean, there's, there's, we have a lot of resources available to us. We have uh, money to spend, but what are we spending it on? Well, you know, we're spending on a decent building, but you know what? We could spend a whole lot more on a building, couldn't we? I mean, we could get involved in some giant building fund where we try to buy a bunch of acreage somewhere out in the edge of town somewhere and, and, and build some giant edifice to man and try to fill it up with people and just and, and you know have a big parking lot and spend a lot you could spend millions of dollars that way yeah. you can spend a lot of money that way but is that necessarily why you know and I've known churches like that that's that became their focus yeah. you know I had to have the biggest building you know, independent Baptist church in terms of square footage you know in northern Michigan and they got it and there was at the end before I left there was 12 people there was enough room in that room for everyone in that building on a Wednesday night to have a thousand square feet to themselves. You know, and why is it with God? Because it was all about the building. It ceased to be about the work. Why is God blessing Faithful Word with finances? Why are people giving into this ministry the way that they do? And I'm not saying, like, you know, we're rolling in it. But we'll look at what we're doing. We're sending people to the Navajo Reservation on a regular basis. We're sending people to Mexico, all expenses paid. We're selling people to Guyana, we're sending people to other, you know, other over the ocean, we're sending them to South Africa, we're sending them, you know, all the time, we're doing these type of things, you know, we're soul winning day in and day, we got this building down here, 
You know, we're, 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 we're using the resources that God has given us to put it back into the work of God, to bless other people. So this is a good principle here, I think, that we see that God is showing us that, hey, if you, you know, I'm going to bless you for this so that you can be a blessing to others. Yeah, right. And, you know, that goes for ministry, and that can even go in our personal lives. You know, we should be people that are always willing to give. You know, if we have it, if we have the ability to give, to give. You know, don't, don't you know, one area I always try to practice this in is in the area of tipping. Okay, and this is something we should all do. You know, especially if you're going to be one of the people that, you know, some people will leave the Bible track at, for the waitress. You know, and here's the thing. I take this kind of person because I have a relative who was a waitress. And when I first got saved, she kind of came to me one day. It's like, she said, you know what? You need to tell your Christian friends that when they leave a Bible track, they should probably leave a tip too. Yeah. That was their tip, a Bible track. Thanks for the service. Here you go. Like, that's great, you know. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, you know, uh, I still need to have. I need to be warmed and filled, like it says in James. Yeah, right. You still need to give me those things which are needful for the body. You know, you, you, well, we're giving you the greatest gift that's ever been given. You know, yeah, but that's that's a gift, friend. You don't pay your your tip that way, right? No, you're not riding on God, God's coattails. You know, paying for your tip. So if we're gonna be, especially if we're gonna be people that are doing that kind of thing, which I'm all for, but let's also give a good tip. You know, like we, we have a, every, I was just there this morning at Panera at 6 a.m. picking up the meals, the, the pastries and the goodies that, that those people get when they go on the Mexico missions trip. And I'm telling you, when you go on these trips, we feed you people, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not getting around. We start out with Panera. There's the best cinnamon rolls in the world. You don't believe me, go try one. And we get all the pastries. But you know what? I, I, I pull up in the church van. It says Faithful Word Baptist Church. I'll tell you what, I leave a tip with those people. And you know what? I always get great service. And we have a good testimony there. They know me by name. Oh, it's Corbin. He's back. You know, because I'm in there, I've been in there so often now. But what if I didn't tip? What if there what kind of reputation would our church have? Yeah, right. Well, there's that stingy church that doesn't ever, you know, give. World generous, right? <clears throat> so we have that, you know, it does affect your reputation too. So we don't want to go through life just being stingy, you know, just holding on to every, you know, trying to squeeze you know, blood out of a rock, you know, pinching pennies so hard that, you know, Abraham Lincoln's nose is bleeding. And, and, and it's Abraham on the penny, right? Yeah, okay. You know, we we want to give. We want to be people that are, are, are giving people, a generous people. That's what we're seeing here. And here's the thing. If we do that, God's going to bless us even more because he knows we're not just going to hoard it to ourselves and we're going to put it back into the work and the blessing of others. So I thought, that, you know, that's, there's a lot more to get here, get to here, but that was definitely worth pointing out. So what's also interesting is the fact that God spares Esau, right, because of the fact that Abraham was his father, which goes to show you that God is no respecter of persons, that he didn't, you know, just, he, he would, it wasn't just Israel that was going to be blessed because of, for Abraham's sake, right. it was also Esau. Right. So, and that's a whole other sermon, but let's go ahead and jump into verse 8 there. It says, and when we pass by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain of Elath from Ezion Gaber, uh, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. For I will not give thee of their land for possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for possession. So here's another instance of God you know, showing favor upon these people, not because of their righteousness, not because of how great they are, but because for, for their father's sake, for Lot. And, uh, Mo and if, you were think if you recall the story here, Moab gets a pretty big pass because there's some bad things that went on with Moab. If you recall the story of, you know, Phineas and, and Zimri when the man brought in the Moabitess woman when the children the plague was in the camp and Zimri had to go and run them through with a spear. You know, that was the Moabites. You know, that, that, that was so these are these people got a pretty big pass. God was willing to look over some things with them. He could have just decided to wipe them out. And it shows us, you know, we have to understand that verses 1 through 9, this is covering a very large portion of time. It wasn't just like they were in, you know, they were, they were in uh, 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 Moab one day, and just before, the day before that, they had been there with, the, uh, you know, with Esau. You know, this wasn't just a week's journey. They were in these, these areas for a long time. And you see that down there in verses uh, 13 and 14. Let's read those real quick. Where it says in verse uh, 13, Now rise up, said I, and get you over the brook Zered. And we went over the brook Zered. And the space which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we came over the brook Zered was 30 and 8 years. So this is a, a great length of time that they're spending in these places, passing over these, 
uh, different coasts and into these different peoples. This wasn't just a, a you know, they were there and gone the next day. They were there for some time. So <clears throat> I don't want to dwell too much on that. So let's get into verse 10 where it says, And the Emems dwelt there in time past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. Now this gets interesting because now God starts to talk about these two groups of people that were very tall, right? He says these people were as tall as the Anakims. And we kind of get this, this is of course the, the story of the Moabites land, you know, that that uh, that before the, Moab, uh, the Moabites there, there were the Emems dwelt there in times past, right? And that it was once inhabited, this land of Moab was inhabited by people, uh, many tall people, right? Talking that, and that's literally what he was talking about, the physical stature, they were very tall. And he says they were as the Anakims. Now, for God to take the time to point out the fact that they were tall people, these must have been some exceptionally tall people. You know, this must, this isn't just like you know your average. You know, this doesn't mean that they just they shop at the big and tall store. You know, these were people that were very tall. And we, these people, there's still people like this today. You know, you'll see the seven foot, the eight foot person, the you know the the, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records, the world's tallest person. And, and they're very tall, you know, and, and uh, exceptionally tall. And I believe that's what the Bible is referring to here. In fact, we'll get into it a little bit and we'll look at about, you know, around how, how approximately how tall these people probably were on average. And it's kind of a similar story there, verse, you know, when it comes to the story of R, verses 17 through 21. And so just so let's read that real quick, uh, verse 17. And you'll kind of see that it's talking about another group of people, but it's alluding the fact about their physical stature. It says in verse 17, the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day, and when thou come overnight against the children of Ammon, distress them not. So you have the Moabites and the Ammonites. Nor meddle with them, for I have not given the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given the children of Lot for possession. This also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in an old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumans, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. So these Anakims, you know, they kind of set the standard. They're like, you're as tall as an Anakim. Right? So you have these two groups of people, and they're both called at tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them, and, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. So he's saying, look, this is where some tall people are living. And, you know, this is, you know, the Bible, nothing's in the Bible by accident. You know, God wants us to understand that these, these were some very tall people. And what it's showing us, too, is that what were they afraid of about passing over into the land of Jordan? They were afraid of the very tall people, right? Mm -hmm. These Anakims that had chariots of iron. They were, they were as grasshoppers in their sight, he said. They were afraid of their physical stature. And here they are just, just walking in these lands where these people were, where other people had come in and destroyed these people. That's what it says there, that they had dwelt there in times past. But the Moabites had destroyed them, right. the, the, uh, and the others had, uh, had destroyed them, right? And now dwelt in their land. So now here they are walking in this land that used to be dwelt, that used to be inhabited by these tall people. And you got to kind of wonder if it started saying, man, we could have done the same thing as these heathen did. If we just trusted in our God, you know, we could have gone and defeated right. these giants, which they went on to do later. But again, it's the, it's the younger generations that's seeing all this. They're saying, well, why were our parents so afraid of these giants? Look, these, these people are here dwelling where these giants were. Why couldn't we have done it? And uh, <clears throat> they're described as tall, and they're both likened on the Anakims. Anakims. And in both accounts, it calls them, ex explicitly, it calls them giants. Right? So, <clears throat> I don't know if we caught that there when we were reading through. Yeah, it says there in verse 20, that also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in old time, and the Anam and, and Ammonites called them Zamzumims. Verse 21, a great people and many and tall as the Anakins. So these tall people were considered giants. Right? And this is important today because we have these false documents out there, and it's embarrassing to have to bring it up. You know, that teaches that there is, that when they read and, you know, and that they were as, as grasshoppers in their sight, people take that literally. And they think that's how tall these people really were. That they, like, the, if this was you down here, this tall, as a grasshopper, then I would be the giant. I mean, think, that's like a, I don't know how, I know one of Pastor Anderson's kids broke it down one time, did the math. I mean, your eyeball would be like the size of a Volkswagen or something like that. You know? You'd be huge, right? And uh, that's not what the Bible is referring to here. You know, that's a figure of speech to express how, you know, they were, they were being, uh, you know, very, uh, they were overdoing it. They were blowing out of proportion. They were trying to just exclaim their concern by, you know, having this figure of speech. And the Bible actually tells us how tall these people were on average. 
And uh, these are, so these literal giants, that's what the Bible calls them, are just simply people of exceptional height. You know, we need even, you might even know somebody who's very tall. I, I think of Brother Aaron, or Pastor Aaron Thompson. Mm -hmm. I think he's 6'8". You know, I'm 6'3", and pe I, I get it. People are like, man, you're, I'm 6'2", actually. I'm always trying to gain that inch. <laughs> he's, he's like, man, you're tall. I don't, and I'm like, oh, I guess. I'm, compared to the average person, I guess I am a tall guy. When I get around Pastor Thompson, I feel like a small guy. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, I'm like, yes, sir, you know? <laughs> and um, and uh, so, but we would say, well, that guy's a giant, right? And we joke about that kind of thing. Or you'll see someone who's very tall, you know? They're giants. They'll say that about them. All they're saying is they're very tall people. They're very big. And that's what these people are. Now, go over to, keep something there. Just go over one page, Deuteronomy chapter 3. See, the Bible does it, it clears it up for us real quick. You know, God doesn't leave us hanging. We just got to keep reading our Bibles. People get to a passage like this, and they're like, oh, the Bible says there were giants. Yeah, right. You know, they had both, their femurs were this big. <laughs> I saw on the internet. <laughs> you know, the internet's a double-edged sword, friend. You can get a lot of truth on the internet. You get also a lot of error. You know, and the important thing is to keep reading your Bible. And you an example, because if you just made it to the next chapter, That's right. you would read here in verse 11 where it says, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained, uh, remained of the remnant of the giants. So this guy, Og, is a giant. He's a remnant of the giants, right? Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. You know, when you're a big guy, you know, the wood frame ain't going to cut it for you. You know, you got to get the bedstead of iron, okay? And uh, it is, is it not in Rabath, the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof. So now we're starting to get an actual idea of ex, you know approximately how tall these people actually were, you know when it's his giant, it just, God doesn't just leave us hanging. And he says, "Look, the, it was nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man." Now, how exactly how long a cubit is is up for debate. Mm -hmm. But if you Google it, like I did, you get a foot and a half. Okay, that's what you get. So you get a foot and a half, about eighteen inches. So well, that would make this guy Og. His bed was 13 and a half feet long. All right, so now I've, I've had this up here, so I need a volunteer. Brother Matt, yeah, I know you got to operate the, the dumb end of this thing, right? <laughs> so the 13 and a half, oh, keep going, keep going, keep going right there. I mean, can you imagine trying to find a hotel? <laughs> Poor Og, you know, he'd go on a journey and be like, hey, uh, you know, I need a room. But the bed's got to be 13 and a half feet. You, could, they, you can't even put that on a hotel rooms, right? Quality in ain't going to cover you, bud. So, I mean, this, now if you want to fit on a bed this big, you know, or, I mean, this is how big, a big of a bed you need, then, you know, they got, his head isn't down there and his feet aren't down here. Who sleeps like that? I don't, right? I, I, we, you give yourself a little room. Right. Yeah. So this doesn't mean this is how tall he was. This is simply how tall his bed was. So, you know, he was probably shorter than that. Maybe take off about three feet, you know, give your foot, self a foot and a half on either end. Thanks. So, I mean, that gives you an idea. Now, so does that equate to a, a you know, 13-story or whatever, 12-story giant being with giant eyeballs? No, I mean, it gives you the measurement. So you get an idea of how tall this guy was. Now, another one we have, and if you, you can just listen here, but... Um, we have another person that we could look to as a giant in the Bible, and of course, that's Goliath. Right? Right. Everyone knows who Goliath was. It's the story of Goliath and uh, David and Goliath. He's referred to as the giant of Gath. And of course, you know, we read in Kings and Chronicles, you hear the, the, the phrase, the, 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 the children of the giant. Right? And that's referring to Goliath. And it says in 1 Samuel 17, I'll read to you, there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, a span is half a cubit. So this guy was nine foot nine, if we go off of Google. Okay, and it might be, you know, give or take a few inches or a foot, maybe. I don't know. But it certainly wasn't what some people are making it out to be. But it calls him a giant, does it not? Yep. And it calls this other guy a giant. So the Bible isn't just, you know, having some mythical, leaving it up to us just to interpret what a giant is. It's showing us what a giant, what's considered a giant. And that's nine and a half feet tall. So how tall was Goliath? Right? Let's just because I like this stuff. I like to get a visual, right? Yeah. Amen. This is fun. Right? This is the junior church preacher coming out of me. <laughs> so that's eight feet right there. That's eight feet right there. So I mean, I'd have to pop a tile. You know, I'm fortunately I'm tall enough I could pop a tile. I'll probably make a mess. But I mean, if so if, if if Goliath walked in here, 
I mean, he'd be in there like this, <laughs> walking around. You can see why they call him the giant. Yeah. Right? Now, we had a giant, you know, there was a person in our, you know, if you grew up in the 80s, like I did, you probably grew up thinking about another giant. Who am I thinking of? Andre. Andre the Giant, that's <laughs> right. Big guy, right? And uh, so it just, it just was showing you here that a giant is just an exceptionally large person. So we kind of get an idea of what a giant looks like. So don't let these fools on the internet, you know, with their Nephilim theory or whatever it is. I think, is that the Nephilim theory? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they, they, you know, <clears throat> you know, they, these, a giant is somebody who's about a foot taller than this ceiling. The Bible calls that a giant. So let's go ahead and move along, though, um, in verse 17. But that's a good lesson, you know. Yeah. I mean, they, they, you read giant chapter 2. Well, if you just turn the page and read the next chapter, you find out how big a giant yeah, is. Yeah, right. You know, if you recall the story of David and Goliath, you find out how big a giant is. The Bible doesn't just leave us hanging. So let's go ahead and pick it up here in verse 17 where it says, That the Lord spake unto me, saying, <coughs> uh, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And then when thou comest over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I have not given thee the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given the land of the Lot for possession. Let's go ahead and jump down to verse 22, or 21. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, <coughs> as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the, the, the Horims from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. So again, they're, they're seeing people that defeated giants and that, that what they had opportunity else to do. Verse 23, And the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Aza. And the Catherines which dwelt for, uh, came forth out of Cathcore, destroyed them, and dwelt in their stead. So he's just giving us this background story right, of, of what's taking place here. Verse 24, Rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thy hand Sihon, king of the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it, and contend with him in battle. So remember, up to this point, he's saying, don't contend with these people. Leave them alone. You know, Buy of them, don't meddle with them. But now he's beginning, they're passing over into another part of this country, into Ar, right, into Sihon, king, uh, the Amorite king of Heshbon, in his land. And he says, possess it, contend with them in battle. Verse 25, this day I will begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble, and shall be in anguish because of thee. So remember, when we get into Joshua, when they... The spies go into Jericho and they speak with Rahab, the, the harlot. She says that, that the people had heard of them and that their hearts didn't melt with fear. That's how the reputation that Israel had developed because they were just destroying these kings. Well, that's where that rep, this is where that reputation began to develop. This is where the first uh, battle. So this is God, of course, beginning to fulfill his promise. Because if you were, if you'd read in Exodus, you'd recall that he promised that he would send an angel before them, right? And would drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So God's saying, look, uh, we're gonna drive these people out of this land. Of course, you know, the angel being, you could say that's Joshua, he was, because um, angel's messenger. And of course, that would also, I believe, referring perhaps to the Lord Jesus Christ who appeared to Joshua right before they went into Jericho. That God was, you know, and God, you know, fought battles for Joshua. You know, uh, specifically, the Bible says the Lord did fight for them that day. So God, of course, is using the human element, but he's, you know, empowering them, and he's using them to drive them out before them. And that's when this begins. This is God fulfilling his promise that he's going to defeat their enemies. So they, this generation that's coming up is seeing the promises of God come true. And God's, you know, showing them his strength, showing them his ability to fight for them and to empower them against the enemy. So that the next time when they come up to, to Jordan, it's not going to be the same ordeal as last time. It's not going to be a faithless generation. But remember, those people really didn't have an excuse because they saw all the wonders that God had done in yeah, Egypt. Right. But now they're seeing actual physical warfare. And he says in verse 26, And I sent messengers out of the wilderness of Kedemoth unto Sion, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway. I will neither turn unto the right hand nor the left, and thou shalt uh, sell me meat for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only I will pass through on my feet, as the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, and the Moabites, which dwelt in Ar, did unto me. 
until I shall pass over Jordan into the land which the Lord our God giveth us. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. Why? For the Lord God had hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thine hand as appeareth this day. So again, this is just, this doctrine of God hardening people's hearts is just throughout scripture. Yep. That there are people that God sets up and hardens their hearts and that he could be glorified in them. You say, well, I don't know that that's necessarily fair to this poor guy, Sihon. Well, you don't know Sihon either. Yeah, right. You don't know what kind of guy that was. So why don't you give God the benefit of the doubt that yeah. knows what he's doing? I mean, he, you know, Pharaoh had plenty of opportunities. And in fact, it says of Pharaoh before God hardened his heart that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. That's right. Pharaoh hardened his heart, and the God said, well, I knew he was going to do that anyway, so he just goes ahead and hardens it more for him. Yep. And it just goes to show us that if we continue to harden our hearts towards God, you know, God will harden, uh, harden it a little more for you. You know, and he'll harden his own heart towards you. And, uh, of course, we know that can't happen to a, a saved person, but, you know, God does harden the hearts of some people for his purposes. And the purpose of, of, of Pharaoh, which I believe is the same case with this Sihon, was so that God could be glorified through them, so that other nations would hear about him, right. you know, and they would begin to fear. The Bible says in Romans 9, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. <clears throat> Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he hardeneth, he will he harden it. So God, you know, it, He has His purposes, and uh, we should. And, and, and it's gonna. This is important to understand because we're gonna get into la latter half of this chapter. It, it's, it's some hard stuff, okay? But we have to understand something that God knows what He's doing, Amen. and that we're reading about people that we know very little of, and that what we do know of, God does not say anything good about them. Yeah. That these were wicked people, and that in all likelihood, this uh, this this Sihon was a, a wicked person. And it already hardened his heart. And you saw how he treated God's people. Did Esau do that? You know, did, did, did the Moabites do right. that? Right. No, they said, come on in. Well, yeah, sure, thanks for the they, they sold them meat. Right. They sold them water. They gave them passage to their land. They allowed them to wander through. But not this guy. This guy's heart was already hardened towards God's people. And God, I believe, just said, okay, you know, we're going to go ahead and double down on that. And I believe that this guy, Simon, had probably already heard what had taken place in Egypt. I mean, that's what we read in Romans there, that God raised him up for that purpose, that that uh, that uh, he would show his power and that his name would be declared through all the earth. I mean, they're not that far from Egypt. Surely word has spread. Right. And he's heard that this people and what had happened, uh, heard this people and what had happened to Egypt where they came out of. And I believe that these, these nations that are being mentioned, uh, you know, the Canaanites and the Hittites and the, and, the, and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, these are reprobate nations. These are nations that are, are given over to wicked things. Go ahead and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, we'll see that. Again, another example of not, you know, judging God harshly. If you just keep reading, you start to learn more about these people. Because humanly speaking, people would read what, what's about to happen in this chapter and say, well, that's not very nice. That doesn't, that doesn't look, make God look good. They, and they would be offended by what they're about to read. But you have to remember about the type of people that God is dealing with right. when he's bringing his people into this land. Wicked, ungodly, heathen. And by the way, that are not without excuse. Or that, are, that, are, that are without excuse. Excuse, excuse me. They had the space of 400 years to get right with God. They had that land all to themselves. They could have gotten right with God any time they wanted to. But they wanted to, to chase their, their, their pagan, heathen gods and commit all the abominations that they did, which we'll read about right here in verse Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. He says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. He's saying, look, when you go in there, don't learn their ways. And he says, There shall not be found among you any of you that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire or useth divination. So that's a pretty wicked sin. You know, when he says pass through the fire, he's not talking about, you know, Jumping through a bonfire. Yeah. Come right. on, son, jump through that fire. Let me see you do it. You know, prove your manhood. He's about literally burning your children in fire yeah. as a sacrifice into a false god. He's saying you're not going to do that. And he's saying <clears throat> you shall not learn to do out the abominations of those nations. That's what these nations were into. Yeah. I mean, if you're the place in a country where you're sacrificing children, how, what what good do you have to offer anybody? How far down the the the, the hole do you have to? To, to go, how far down do you, down the gutter do you have to get 
to start sacrificing children. That's not something you just start out one day. Right. You don't just go from being a godly nation to all of a sudden you're burning children to fire. Yeah, right. That's a that's an ungodly descent into wicked, vile being just a reprobate. Yeah. And that's what all these nations were doing. So as we begin to read this book and we read about what God does to these people, especially in this chapter, keep in mind who he's doing it to before you judge God too harshly. That God is executing righteous indignation and wrath upon wicked people that would burn their own children in fire. I mean, your own children. I mean, I'm not saying it's any less wicked to burn somebody else's kid. But, I mean, if you, I can't even fathom getting that place, but you would think it would be easier to do that to somebody else's kid than your own child? To allow that to happen? I mean, I, I, I can't stand to see my kids stub a toe. Right. You know? Well, I, maybe not that much of something. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, we don't want, we can't imagine anything bad happening to our kids. You know, so they, when you get a little boo-boo and we want to kiss it and put a little band-aid on it and pat their head, tell them everything's going to be all right. These people are just like, let's burn them. Let's sacrifice them to our God. This is a wicked bunch of people. And he goes on and says that he was a divination or observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. Now, keep that in mind in this Halloween season, okay? That God considers these things to be an abomination. Yeah, and that right. stupid billboard they got right over here for yep. their slaughterhouse or whatever, yep. where you can go watch all their ghouls and goblins and go to the haunted house where they have witches and sorcerers and necromancers. Oh, it's all pretend. Well, you know what? It's, for some people, it wasn't pretend. Yeah, right. And, you know, and we shouldn't even, uh, we shouldn't have any mere appearance of evil. Yeah. Right. So God doesn't want anything to do with wizards, uh, familiar spirits. You know, your Harry Potter is wicked. Right. Okay? And, and you say, well, you're, I think you're being a little harsh. You know what? That's teaching people. That's how you get kids. You start teaching them young about being a wizard. True. About being a necromancer. Being a sorcerer. Oh, oh it's all pretend. Then you find out when you get a little older that it's not pretend. Right. right. That you can get in touch with the undead. Or not the undead, yeah. excuse me, with, with the undead <laughs> zombies. <that> are <laughs> but uh, you can get in touch with uh, unclean spirits, is what I'm trying to say. You can get in touch with demonic forces. Right. That, that stuff's real. Yep. That's not just playing around. You know, I don't have time to say, uh, to say time, but if you want to talk about it, see me after service so we can talk about uh, some of my friends that messed around with Ouija board. Started feeling people touching their necks and saying things out loud that weren't that weren't even in the room. It's crazy. Yeah. And people mess around with this stuff and they think they're playing games. Right. And God knows better. Yeah. And God says it's an abomination. Stay yeah, away yeah. from it. Yeah, that's right. Because people get mixed up on that and they think they found some occultic, they found some mystical, hidden secret knowledge that that nobody else knows, and they'll deny the God of the Bible because yeah. they get into this occult stuff. Yeah. But all they're tapping into is the devil yeah. Yeah. and his and his minions. So a witcher, a charmer, a consulter of familiar spirits, you know, Miss Cleo. Sorry. Who remembers Miss Cleo? Nobody. All right. What? Call Miss Cleo today, right? <laughs> She'll tell you your fortune. You know, she was, she would get the, uh, she, you know, if it was up to God. And uh, a charmer, a consultant of familiar spirits, a wizard, or a necromancer. For all, the, uh, all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Well, we don't actually do it. We just dress up like we do it once a year and run around and just play pretend. Okay, well, you just play pretend that you were an abomination. Yeah, right. So we have fun with that. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God just drive them out before thee. Why was God driving these people out? And let me just come out and say it. It's genocide. Yep. And people will, will look, we're, we're about to see it here in this chapter, genocide. And that's one of the criticisms that, that you know, atheists try to level at the Bible. Well, God committed genocide in the Bible. I don't, I'm not going to apologize for it. Right. Yes, he did. But let's look at who he did it to. Right. Wicked, and, and let's look at why he did it. He did yeah. the wicked people that were committing abomination in the eyes of God. Yeah. The most terrible sins there are. And, and it, you know, and, and by the way, man commits genocide today. You know, man does the same thing, but does he do it for the same reasons? You think man's out there, the men are, are slaughtering entire ethnicities because of righteous indignation? No. No, they're doing it for power, wealth, land, mm -hmm. for selfish reasons. God here did it. God doesn't do it all the time, but God did it in this instance because there are wicked people that needed to be wiped out. Oh, that's right. And you know what? And well, let's just keep going here. What this shows us is that naked, or, excuse me, nations can become so wicked that destroying them is the only way to deal with them. And that's what's going on. These people are beyond repair. 
God could just move his people in and say, hey, we're going to make them better. We're going to teach them in a right way. God knew, God knows, and we see this in the history of Israel, that if they are, if they go in there and they are around them, they're going to learn their ways. And they're going to bring, the, here's the thing, folks, the good are always made worse by the bad. The good never make the bad good. The bad always make the good bad. One, you know, the spoiled apple ruins the whole bunch type of thing. It never works the other way around. The bad always make the good bad. You say, well, if we just get the bad people around the good people, the good people will make the bad people good. It doesn't work like that. Right. And God knows this. And that's why God said, look, the only solution is just wipe them out and get them out of there. They've had plenty of space. They have plenty of hundreds of years to knock off what they're doing, to get right with God. They didn't want to do it. They've gone down this dark path and it's led them to the most abominable things that humankind can do. Right. They're beyond hope. They have to go. And that's where God is with them. The Bible says in Psalm 9, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Yep. All nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. And that's what we see happening here. Look at verse 31. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have begun to give, on, uh, to give Sihon and his land before thee. Begin to possess it that thou mayest inherit his land. Then Sihon came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jahaz. And the Lord our God delivered him before us, and we smote him and his sons and all his people. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. God wiped out every single human being. In a lot of different instances we see that God spares women and children. But in this instance, God does not spare them. God wipes them completely off the face of the earth. Takes them out from, there, there's not one of them left. Even the little ones. Right. And you say, well, I don't like that. That offends me. I don't like the God of the Bible. I'm offended. Well, you know what? You're not going to make it past Genesis 7. Where right. God destroys the entire earth with water. Amen. Remember that story? Noah? It's not just a story about cute little animals getting on an ark. Yeah, right. It's a story about God destroying the whole earth with water. Yep. And every single person that was alive besides the eight that were on the ark are dead. That's right. Including the, 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 the women and the little ones. So if this offends you, I don't know how you get past Genesis 7. So what is this is showing us is that a nation can become so wicked that even the children are beyond repair. That even they cannot be spared. And that happens. Children can become reprobate. Right. It can happen. I believe I've witnessed it in my own personal life. That I've seen a, a child become reprobate before they even got out of high school. Yeah. It happens all the time. True. And what this also shows us is that a nation's sins has severe consequences. That when you start to practice these things, God takes the gloves off yeah. and starts to deal. And that God means business. God's not messing around. God, God has no place for these abominations. Yeah. You know, and, and America should take heed to this story yeah. today. Because we may not be burning in fire, but let me tell you something. There's about 3,000 unborn children getting slaughtered every day in this country. There's a lot of innocent blood on this country's hands that is going to be accounted for one day. Amen. And this country is forgetting God, and it is being turned into hell. Yep. And we are seeing uh, you know, these public schools being turned into reprobate factories. Right. There I said it. It's, it's happening. I'm not saying if you go to public school, you're going to end up being a reprobate. But I'm saying if you go to public school, you're probably going to rub elbows with one. Yeah. I've had kids come up to me, even out of this church, they go to public school and say, hey, there's a, there's a fag at my school, I can't stand it. You know, back when I was in public school, it was not cool to be a fag. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and now, and now a lot of these kids, it's the cool thing to be the fag. And they, everyone's loving, everyone's accepting it, everyone's promoting it. And they're being taught lies, you know, evolution is being crammed down their throat. They're being taught that the Bible is just this old bronze, you know, bronze age book to be ignored. And they don't have any morality. They're told to just do whatever you want. And, and we're seeing our nation being turned into hell. Yep, true. And that's what we see happening in this country here. So before we start boo-hooing for Sion and the Amorites, yeah. let's understand the type of people that we're dealing with here. That they did oh, these abominations. And, and when a country can go so far down the path of sin, it can even affect the children. And, and the God you know, deals harshly with sin. Sin comes with severe consequences on a national level. And we should take heed of that. You know, rather than des despising God for it and saying, how dare he, you know, maybe we should get on our knees and, and beg God for mercy. Yeah. And pray God for grace. And and, 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 do, and to go out there and do the work to prevent our nation from going completely into the gutter. Amen. You know, and do what we can. I mean, 
we think about soul, you know, and we're talking about soul winning and trying to go out there and spare some people from the wrath to come. I mean, it, it's like going out into a river and just, you know, a raging river and just trying to just, you know, get a bucket and get a few scoops out. We can't stop all the torrents of souls that are just going to be going over the ledge into hell in this country. You know, we can get a few. Yeah. You know, we can go out and, and, get, and pull a few out of the fire along the way. We can't stop it, but we can get a few. Amen. So rather than just despising God for this, maybe we should just understand the severity of what we're up against and, and do something about it. So he says in verse 35, Only the cattle we took for a prey unto ourselves, and the spoils of the cities which we took, from Eror, even, uh, which is by the brink of the river Ar uh, Arnon, and from the city which is, that is by the river, even unto Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. And I love how he's just giving God the glory for it. Amen. Amen. And showing these people, you know, what's going on here. God's beginning to lead them into this, this night. This isn't the promised land, right? We know that. They're wandering. But God is beginning to show them, okay, you know, you started out and had your compass Mount Seir. You let this settle in, the reality of your situation that you're about to go wander. Now let's go show you what I'm, what's, what's you know, possible with me. And I believe what he's doing is he's training that next generation that's coming up as they're waiting for these, these men of war, as it says there, to be wasted in the wilderness and to be destroyed. And when he's showing the generation that's coming up, look, I can fight, I will fight for you. There will not be one city too strong for you. So they wouldn't have that same lack of faith when it would come their turn to go up and go into the promised land. It says the Lord God uh, delivered unto us. And I just, you know, I can imagine being in the camp of Israel and starting, it must have really started to dawn on some of them what they could have had. Yep. Man, we could have done this over there. Man, we could have been in the promised land of the grapes of Eshgal. We could have been fighting these battles over there, but now we're over here fighting them. And he says in verse 37, uh, Only unto the land uh, of the children of Ammon thou camest not, nor unto any place of the river Jabbok, nor unto all uh, the cities and the mountains, nor unto whatsoever the Lord God, our God forbade us. So as we saw, you know, Esau, the Moabites, these people here uh, that are mentioned, in Jabbok, in the mountain cities of the mountains, God said, you're not going to fight them. And what this is showing us is that God, I believe, wants us to fight specific battles. And that we should only be involved in the battles God wants us to fight. You know, there's some battles God does not want us to fight in this life. You know, they're, they're, no, they're, they're noble causes. They might even be worthy. You know, but they're just not what God wants us to fight. And people, you know, I believe this is, and this is kind of a different thought I'm wrapping up here, but I want to leave us with this thought, is that God wants us to fight a specific battle. And he wants us to fight his battles. And people can get caught up today fighting a lot of different battles because there's a lot of different things to fight for. You know, and, and, and we have to step back. Whatever it is we're, we're going to give our lives to, you know, people, they want to they change, change things through politics. You know? right. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, I, I had a run with that during, mm -hmm. you know, Ron Paul's second run. And I, you know what I learned is that that system's corrupt. Yeah, right. There's no fixing that. You can't, you can't. You can't beat people at their own rigged game, type of a thing, you know. And I'm not gonna, if I'm gonna fight a battle, it's gonna be the battle that God wants me to fight, the good fight of faith. Amen. You know, we gotta, we gotta be involved in fighting for the hearts and souls of, of men and women out in this community. You know, we've got a battle here in Tucson. We have a spiritual warfare to go fight. Right. In these neighborhoods, in these highways, in these hedges, and taking back, you know, those that are brought, that are brought. Uh, have been taken captive by the devil at his will, Amen. you know, and we should go out and fight that battle. And, you know, there's a lot we can learn from this chapter, you know, some of the things we learned is that, you know, God always has another plan for us. You know, if we mess up in one area, you know, maybe we need to just kind of let that sink in and then move on with our life, you know, turn northward and start to do a good work for God and be used of him in another way. Uh, you know, we learned that uh, don't believe everything you hear on the internet, right? <laughs> right? We learned about, about approximately how giants are big, and, you know, they're not as big as some people make them out to be, but they're still pretty big. And we learned that, you know, nature, there's severe consequences to sin, you know, and, and, and rather sitting around and trying to shake our fist at God or be bitter about him, why don't we just go out and fight the battle he wants us to fight right. and see him deliver some souls, and we can bring some uh, folks with us on our way to heaven. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray.